from Bill Stubblefield, former Berkeley County Commission President, and Steve Pearson, who joins us in this segment, too. He is the editor of the Independent Observer. Steve, welcome. Thank you for being with us. Good morning. It's uh, good to be over here in uh, Berkeley County. I, I, I felt a fresh air crossing the line there. It's wonderful when you cross the border. I could feel it from here. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Your Jefferson County folks will be very appreciative of that comment. <laughs> Indeed, yes. Well, it seems calmer over here this morning. <laughs> it's always a little bit calmer here. Uh, we'll begin with uh, opening statements, and each of you will have a minute or so for your opening statement. Then we'll circle back around with closing statements. We'll do that in the inverse order. In between, you'll have questions from Bill and from Steve, and I invite you to uh, respond as thoroughly as you wish. Just try to keep those responses to two minutes or so. If your name or one of your policies or published thoughts are invoked by the other, you're welcome to respond directly after that person has concluded their statement. And we'll begin with opening statements now. And uh, for that, we'll begin with the incumbent, Kent Leonhardt. Kent? Well, thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. And thank you, Berkeley County, for listening in. Uh, this is a very important position. The Department of Agriculture touches the life of every West Virginian every day, and most people don't even know we exist. Uh, but we've been working very hard over the last almost eight years to improve that uh, visibility of what the Department of Agriculture actually does. And, you know, my plea to the uh, voters out there today is to please reelect me one more time. Uh, for the Commissioner of Agriculture's job. You really don't want to change horses, particularly when you're in the middle of a crisis. You know, I led the Department of Agriculture through COVID. Uh, we did not, uh, like you heard in the news, uh, dump any milk. We did not euthanize any hogs. We did not euthanize any poultry. We kept all those agricultural businesses open and running, and we did a lot better than our surrounding states. I talked to all the commissioners uh, throughout the country uh, quite a bit through the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, and we did do a lot better here in West Virginia than many others did during COVID. And now we're facing a historic drought. Uh, we're going to get the department is working very closely with its partners at the USDA, uh, institutions of higher learning, and we are working very hard to uh, bring relief to the farmers here in West Virginia. It's a God-created uh, crisis that we nobody expected to have. We're the epicenter of it, and we're going to get through it. Thank you, Commissioner. And the challenger, Deborah Stiles. Thank you, um, WRNR TV 10 and uh, thank you Berkeley County for listening in and in the other surrounding counties in the eastern panhandle. It's good to be back into the panhandle. Um, my uh, mother was raised on a farm in Hampshire County. I have a small farm in Tucker County on the same mountain where my ancestors have been farming for multiple generations. And um, while um, we have been through crises in agriculture, um, in the most recent years. Um, I would argue that um, we are essentially on the Titanic and there's an iceberg coming for us and we don't really know how to stop that quite yet, but there are research opportunities, research that we know and policies and regulations that we know can either help or hinder our farmers. And what I would like to do if I'm elected is to reduce the regulatory burden and to protect our farmland from encroachments that uh, do not uh, add to the collective well-being. Um, I would like to build upon the successes of 4-H and FFA programs which are uh, growing but yet need more support in order to provide a future for our agriculture. My um, uh, slogan, if you will, this campaign, as I've been going across the state and so far, uh, due to a, a couple of unfortunate family um, medical emergencies, I have been to 50 counties, uh, not 55 yet, the final five counties in the next two weeks. Um, what I've been hearing farmers say is that we need to pay attention to our foundational industries. We all eat, and therefore we need to pr protect and support through leveraging the USDA resources, um, through leverage of the resources that have been provided through the Farm Bill and through the USDA, um, not have them get held up um, through some kind of machinations in Charleston, but rather get to the farmers where they need to be uh, to help our farmers grow the food, the fiber um, that we all use every day in our lives. Um, so let's grow West Virginia's future, and um, 
in particular, um, since I'm speaking to Eastern Panhandle um, folks today, I would say y'all have been the mainstay of our orchards. My mom grew peaches in order to go to Shepherd <laughs> way back when. Or she, excuse me, she picked peaches, other people grew them. And um, we can rebuild our ag sector, make it better than it is today. While we are seeing some upward trends, the larger uh, trends globally are unsettling for anyone who does not tackle the scale and sustainability issues within the industry, and that's what I intend to do. Thanks very much for this opportunity. Well, we're pleased to have both of you here as uh, statewide candidates. Uh, it's a thrill for us to have you here in Berkeley County as part of our TV10 forum. And we'll begin with questions. Uh, Mr. Stubblefield. Uh, good morning, folks. So glad that you joined us today. Uh, Commissioner, you mentioned this uh, the drought, the historic drought that we've been going through. Uh, during the interim, there was $10 million alloc allocated from the legislators to go to the farmers for some remediation of the drought. Uh, is this enough to make a difference? Uh, I first ask you, Commissioner, if it's not enough, what should we be doing as a state to give relief to the farmers? Well, uh, thank you for the question, and uh, I'm very grateful that the governor put that uh, funding on the call that we requested, and I'm very grateful for the legislature for passing it. The We don't know exactly how much we're going to need because this drought's going to go on into 2025. Uh, we've gotten some rain recently. You can go drive by, and a lot of people will say we're out of the drought because the fields are looking a little bit greener. But what's in those fields? Some of those fields are loaded with weeds, and they're green too. Uh, we don't know the full extent. We have uh, springs that haven't come back yet that people use for watering their livestock. We've got crops that were short uh, this year from that drought, and we don't know the full extent of that yet either. And we have uh, people that are have been feeding hay since actually – early in July. So we don't know how far it's going to go and we don't know the full sell-off. This is a great start. This is with uh, the leaders throughout the state in agriculture and, and I'm hoping the Farm Service Agency can provide me some acreage of what they've already paid on, what they anticipate paying on. From that I have another meeting at 11 o'clock to start discussing further the uh, use of the $10 million, we're going to get it to the farmers, and we're going to make it easy. We're not going to make it some bureaucracy, as people allude to from time to time down in Charleston. It's going to get to the farmers, but the primary focus is going to be reseeding of the pastures because right now the weeds are coming up in it, and I've talked to farmers all over the state that are having that issue. So I don't know if it's enough, uh, if we need more. The good news is the things that we're going to do, we have a little bit of time to get this right because the reseeding is too late for this year uh, for the fall seeding. They're going to be doing mostly frost seeding, and that will come in the spring. So we're going to get this right. Thank you. Ms. Stiles? In terms of um, looking at um, agriculture, big picture, I, I do want to applaud the efforts of the legislature and um, the governor for finally responding to the needs of farmers. But these are long-term issues. Um, it's not just a matter of having to reseed pastures either this fall or in the spring um, or to deal with fields that never grew corn because we didn't have enough water. Um, it's about looking at, for example, I don't know if you can pick up this um, graph or not, these two graphs. Um, these are from the USDA ARS report from 2023. And the top graph shows 100 years of cattle and calves inventory in West Virginia. Um, and the bottom graph is 100 years of cattle and cal calves inventory in the United States. And if you look at the two graphs, you see that the West Virginia one is very up and down. Now that shows volatility over time, right? And let's look at the figures. Um, the record low in West Virginia for cattle and calves was first recorded in 1867 with an inventory of 362,000 head. The cattle and calves inventory in 2023, just a little over a year ago, was only 375,000 head. Now, while we can take into account some urban development since the Civil War era, the trends over time show that 
the capacity of West Virginia agriculture is not being met. We have opportunities that are boundless in West Virginia. We can use goat's milk to make lotion. We can make soap. We can make socks. We can make um, feed corn. We can make feed oats. We can grow um, all these crops. Uh, we can grow hemp. We can grow sheep, which provide wool. But over time, we have not been meeting our potential. We are at a low in certain sectors where we actually should be, you know, building our capacity. And that has to do with policy decisions and regulatory decisions that have been made over not only the past eight years, but but federal decisions that are longer term. So I intend, with my international experience, I was a Fulbright scholar in 1994, I intend to go to Washington and advocate for our farmers and to work closely with our state government and with our partners. My dad was a county extension agent at the county level his entire career for the Cooperative Extension Service at WVU. I have been on West Virginia State's campus. I have met with WV excuse me, WVU folks, former uh, uh, colleagues of my father, and I know that we can turn things around, um, but we have to put the right laws, policies, and regulations into effect. So dealing with the drought, dealing with the crisis of climate change, which is not um, you know, some fiction. This is a reality. As a farmer at the Jefferson County Market uh, said to me, climate change is a reality. This produce farmer is dealing with this every single week. Um, we have to have the right person in the commissioner's job in order to meet and work well with all of our partners, local, state, and federal, and even reaching out internationally to make sure that we build a scale appropriate and sustainable ag industry. Thank you. Mr. Leonhardt, you wanted to respond. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm a little bit confused on some of the figures that are being used considering they're spanning over 100 years. If you take the 20, uh, 2023 report that she mentioned, you will, see, you will see if you go to the National Ag Statistics, that was a year when cattle numbers in the United States were down 4%. That's the whole nation. But West Virginia's cattle numbers were up 5,000 head. Sheep numbers were up 1,000 head. Hog numbers were up 1,000 head. Goat numbers were up about 1,000 head as well. We've seen a 57% increase in red meat production in the state of West Virginia since I've been Commissioner of Agriculture. We've seen 51% more uh, products going into uh, wholesale markets since I've been Commissioner of Agriculture. And when I started as Commissioner of Agriculture, the last national ag statistics was around $748 million of agricultural output. Uh, the last NAS, NAS agricultural statistics that came out, and this was all uh, for a five-year period since I've been Commissioner of Agriculture, we we're at almost $950 million. That's a, almost a that's about a $200 million increase. My goal in the next uh, administration is to bring it over that $1 billion mark that we've never seen. But we've been on an uphill climb. The drought's going to kick us back a little bit, but we're going to recover. By the way, for those of you listening on the radio side, uh, to be legal here, you're listening to our candidate forum on Talk Radio WNR Martinsburg and uh, TV 10. Ms. Stiles, you wanted to respond to that? Uh, yes. Uh, just to clarify, um, I don't think that we are in disagreement that the sector has grown despite the challenges. But West Virginia and the Appalachian region more generally is going through some pretty tremendous upheavals. Um, I'm an associate member of the UMWA. Um, we have upheavals in the coal mining industry. Um, we have uh, perfectly good arable farmland that is being turned into housing developments. Um, the role of the commissioner is to get out there and advocate um, to be that presence for agriculture uh, for the, the state as a whole. I've been visiting uh, since I announced my candidacy in February when I filed with the Secretary of State. What I'm hearing from farmers is that there are regulatory problems, uh, 
legal law issues that need to be addressed. They feel that they're not getting the responses from the West Virginia Department of Agriculture that they need. And so if I'm elected, I would be tapping a particular individual for a navigator position so that when someone calls in, they don't wait for a call back. That person is knowledgeable and able to say, well, the Farm Service Agency, it sounds like they are the best fit for you. Here is this program. That is a federal entity, but a lot of farmers, they want to, you know, they reach out to our State Department of Agriculture, and rightfully so. We should be that point of contact. And unfortunately, um, what I've been hearing most recently is that, that um, the Department of Agriculture at the state level is not. And so I want to fix that and also initiate a full um, rural and farmer policy council across the state. It will be challenging with the challenges of internet uh, access for a lot of folks in rural areas. But I would like to do this so that we can make course corrections more quickly than we've seen, for example, with the drought crisis. Thank you. You wanted to respond again, Commissioner? Y yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was at the uh, Jefferson County Farmers Market on uh, Saturday morning before I went over to the uh, Midway Days uh, in Jefferson County, and every farmer at that market said, I have their vote. Uh, not one person complained about anything, and that was at both forums. A couple weeks ago, I was at the Berkeley County, or the, I'm sorry, the Morgan County Farmers Market, and every farmer I talked to at the market said that they were backing me for re-election, and I did not get any complaints about the over... Uh, stressing of regulatory thing. Campaigns are wonderful things. They bring up all sorts of things that come out. I was at the uh, forum for the delegates last night, and one of the delegates said that she talked to a farmer, and there was eight permits she needed at from the Department of Agriculture to uh, to, to be at that farmer's market. And I went back and I reviewed our marketing because uh, we put out a booklet on farmers markets on how to best uh, be a work with the farmer's market, and at the most I could get, if you're selling potentially hazardous foods that are time and temperature dependent, the most permits for a farmer to be at a farmer's market that I could find was three, but yet the candidate was saying there were eight. So sometimes you have to talk about the information that's being put out there. Uh, it's really not all that bad. People go to a farmer's market, they go to a grocery store, they expect their food to be safe. You have that expectation that when you pull that product off the shelf that it's safe to eat. We have not had foodborne illnesses breaking out here in the state of West Virginia in the past eight years. Not, it's not that it's not going to ever happen, but we've been doing everything we can to keep the market as free as possible and to make sure that you eat from a safe and affordable and abundant food supply. And we've accomplished that mission. Go to Steve Pearson for the next question. Okay. Well, welcome. Thanks for coming today. Um, I wanted to zoom out, take a, a little bit of a broader you know, question. It's, it's an issue that both of you raised in terms of you know, the, the visibility of uh, the agricultural department and the foundational industry. So for all the non-farmers, and there's a lot of them in Berkeley County and Jefferson County and Eastern Panhandle, I mean, thankfully, we can still you know, see farmers, but you know, there's, there are a lot fewer farmers than there were. Um, but for the rest of the people voting, when they come to your name on the ballot, you know, what, why does the Agricultural Department matter, and what can the Secretary of Agriculture do to, you know, broaden and, and make sure that the rest of the, you know, the entire state understands the importance of that role? I'll start with the sitting commissioner. Well, well, thank you for that question. I love being able to get that type of information out there. I just talked in the last segment a little bit about the food safety and things that we've done to make sure that that abundant food supply is available to the citizens of West Virginia, and we want to make sure it's healthier. Uh, the other things that people don't realize that we're responsible for the animal health throughout this, the state of West Virginia. We're the only one of two states that has not had avian influenza in a commercial flock. Two states, Louisiana and West Virginia, in the last two years. I think that's quite an accomplishment of the education we've put out and the uh, farming practices that we've helped uh, the farmers out there. You know, good biosecurity is being uh, preached all the time. But think about the tourism things that are going on in the state of West Virginia that everybody talks about, but they never talk about the Department of Agriculture's role. And that is, you know, what makes tourism in West Virginia? That's the beautiful forests and the clean waters. Well. West Virginia is the 
only state and the well the first state there's another state that's going to make it uh, that meets the 2025 Chesapeake Bay restoration goals and this listing area is in that Chesapeake Bay region in fact we've had streams delisted under my watch for agricultural hazard in the Chesapeake Bay restoration we're the only state doing that now we've already started to take those lessons learned and moved it over to the Ohio River Basin for the rest of the state because the Ohio River is the second most endangered river in the nation people don't realize that and we're going to be working on getting that cleaned up just the way we've been cleaning up and doing our part for the Chesapeake Bay. So that's, that's, a, that's great news uh, that we've had in the last eight years. The other thing is the beautiful forest. Uh, how would the new River Gorge designation that everybody's so happy about be if those trees had been eaten up by what's now called the spongy moth or any of the other invasive species? Or you go over to... Uh, uh, Blackwater Falls, those beautiful hemlocks that make that state park so beautiful were all saved by the Department of Agriculture. And that's part of our plant industries division. So there's an awful lot that the Department of Agriculture does to help promote the tourism in the state of West Virginia that most people don't realize that we're involved in. And then we have a growing sector in agritourism, and you'll see that farmers markets have actually tripled. Numbers of permits going out for farmers markets have actually tripled under my administration. Um, Steve, would you repeat the question, please? Um, the, the audio is a little bit low, and I had trouble hearing yeah, you. Yeah, sorry. I'm, we're, we're balancing the, the ear thing here. So what I was uh, hoping is that, you know, why does the, uh, for, you know, for, for non-farmers, you, know, you know, across the entire, and farmers too, but why does the uh, agricultural department, you know, matter? And what can the secretary do to influence, you know, the public's perception uh, and you know, elevate the uh, the role of the of the department. Well, I would agree with uh, the commissioner in a lot of uh, realms. For example, the farm to table, the farmers markets. Um, I've met a lot of really wonderful women that um, you know are involved in those uh, farmers markets, women and men that are just excited about being able to be a front line for. Uh, those who do not farm and wish to have fresh produce. However, um, you have in the state of West Virginia as a whole um, very little arable land, which is why the farmable land, the arable land uh, in the eastern panhandle as well as along the Ohio River desperately needs to have a strong advocate um, in this position. Because, uh, for example, when I was at the state uh, Grange, uh, the Patrons of Husbandry board meeting, um, there was a discussion about the fact that, um, and I'm not sure who brought it up first, either the commissioner or myself, but we were talking about, um, you know, siting of industrial developments on land that is really good farmland. I am not opposed to industrial developments. Let me be clear about that. But... Um, there is a role for the commissioner to play in saying to the governor and the rest of the team, and of course, if I'm elected and Steve Williams is elected and Glenn Elliott is elected for U.S. Senate, then we have folks that I can go to and say, you know, there is another property here that is equally suitable. Uh, we'll get the tax revenue that we need from that industrial development, but we will not be... Uh, taking our future farm land, our land that we can grow food on, taking it away from future production. And that is where I've seen that the, the current administration, uh, with its lopsided reality in, in um, uh, the state legislature, there's not balance. And what we as a team are hoping to do, uh, us Democrats, is restore balance and compromise to government and make sure that we have those who listen with compassion and empathy to what needs to be done. Um, there, there's a lot of potential. There's been a lot that's been accomplished. But um, I know of instances that where, um, you know, I have received information from farmers, um, and I'm happy to provide that documentation, um, where there have been fields burned um, and, uh, you know, essentially farmers being hampered by those policies and regulations and how they're carried out in the last eight years. And, and farmers are telling me they need to see some change. 
What do you mean by fields burned, Deborah? Uh, these are fields that connect to the hemp industry, which we were ahead of the curve in terms of trying to um, work to uh, have a absolutely safe uh, regulatory regime in this state. And unfortunately, things have – I don't think there's time enough for me to explain – um, the medical cannabis, the regulatory regime that unfolded with respect to that prior to, to that, and where we are right now. As you all may be aware and your listeners may be aware, Steve Williams, who's running for governor on the same ticket I am, um, put out a press release a while ago um, that spoke to the, the potential through ballot initiative to legalize the adult use, recreational use of cannabis. Now, while it is a personal choice whether to consume or not to consume, we have to be clear that the way things are being done right now, there is a wild west out there and some things are getting through that are not safe for consumers and that is under this, this current administration and um, that is not completely the fault of the Department of Agriculture. For example, there have been funding opportunities that um, you know, have come from the federal government and then they have somehow gotten hung up in the governor's office. And uh, that is what my uh, worthy opponent uh, discussed at the Grange meeting, for example, that he wanted to move the Division of Forestry because that's something that Gus Douglas, the longtime Democratic Commissioner of Agriculture, uh, did and what I want to do is is if everyone's in agreement with the council that I spoke of and others that you know we have no problem then I know that if Steve Williams is governor that will go through and my worthy opponent was not uh, able to convince the governor of the importance of that change in um, the management of our resources, both forest and, and oh, well, agriculture. To, to clarify on the burning of the fields, are you... They were hemp fields because they the exceeded... the agricultural commissioner of burning the fields or... That is incident? an employee of the West Virginia Department of Agriculture. Okay. Burning fields because of a, a regulation that connects to uh, the THC level. And uh, well, I'd like to let Commissioner... Yes, absolutely. ...respond to that question. <clears throat> Yes, um, um, that that's happened. There's no doubt about that. The uh, the legalization of hemp come, came out of the 2018 Farm Bill. The Department of Agriculture uh, developed a plan, and we had to submit that to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and that plan was approved. The legal definition of hemp is anything with THC levels below 0.3 percent. Anything above 0.3 percent is illegal. Prior to harvesting of the field, the law requires, and we just, you know, as a regulatory agency, you know, we, everybody talks about business development, but really our, the majority of the Department of Ag is regulatory. But and as a regulatory agent, we're abide to uphold the law. And the law says that if a field comes in, is tested 30 days prior to harvest, that it is in the marijuana level, then it has to be destroyed. And that was figures are presented to the farmer and the farmer I have not had any problem with any farmer not agreeing that their field was hot and their field had to be destroyed sometimes it's by disking in sometimes it's by burning but that is so very rare a lot of it comes from the genetics of the plants of the seed that they buy from a lot of times out of the state of West Virginia genetics plays a big role in whether a plant's going to grow and the timing and the agricultural practices of the farmer and the farmers learn we've yes we've had a very robust uh, hemp industry we're doing better than our neighboring states and in fact we've done so well some uh, hemp processing plants have moved from Pennsylvania down to the state of West Virginia, and they're all in compliance with the law. We have uh, time for one more question. I would invite you to keep your responses to about two minutes or so, so we have time for your closing statements as well. Uh, did you want a quick response to that, Deborah? Uh, yes, please. If you could keep it to 30 seconds or less. Yeah. Um, again, because I don't have the opportunity to provide the evidence of the farmers, and I do not wish to to make public, I will say that for the record, Steve Williams and uh, Kamala Harris and myself, you know, we have said we've got to attack this issue from the federal down to the state level. And we had an opportunity. We, we missed that opportunity. 
um, back after the 2018 Farm Bill, but we have an opportunity now to turn hemp into other products. We're not just talking about cannabis for consumption. We're talking about packing material, textiles, um, you know, fabric. That is how we rebuild our economy by bringing on the bioeconomy. It's not ter- having a, you know, a law that we that say cannot be changed or a regulation that we, that we say we cannot be changed. We can get in there and we can fix this and we can allow our farmers to grow the fiber and the food that we need. Thank you. Mr. Stubblefield. Uh, yes, this will be a fairly quick question. Uh, during the last general session, uh, r- the access to raw milk uh, was, was passed. Do you have any concerns about this legislation? Start with the commissioner. Well, um, there's, there's a lot of people that contact the Department of Agriculture over this issue, and there are some people out there that are very much concerned. But I'm a free market type of person, so I had no problem. The reason the bill didn't pass before is because there were so many onerous rules put on the Department of Agriculture to do something, and there was a fiscal note of $450,000 attached to it. So when the legislators wanted to put the bill through again, I told them, don't put those regulations in and the bill will get through. And that's exactly what happened. And the bill was passed. So, you know, everybody eats to their own. You take it, make sure you know your farmer. That's what I've always told everybody. Make sure that the person that's selling the raw milk opens up their uh, creamery for inspection by the buyer so that they can see the cleanliness at the thing. That's the only concern that I have. But that's up to each individual. So now you can go to a farmer's market. That's one regulation that's been removed underneath my administration, and people can enjoy the raw milk if they so choose. And if they choose not to, they can continue using dairies the way they have always. Okay. Ms. Stiles? Um, we don't have enough fresh fruits, vegetables, um, dairy products, etc. So we still have uh, a lot of regulations to go through and fix. Um, The raw milk bill, as I've looked at it um, and discussed it with Steve Williams and other folks, um, there are some concerns, but at the same time, I know of folks that, um, you know, are in favor of using raw milk. And, of course, in Europe, raw milk cheeses are, are very, very common. So there are ways to uh to regulate this safely um it's still not there yet um i would argue and um i think it's important for me to to point out that that you know i see myself as part of a team and um like i said uh stephen wendelin um i have not yet said but stephen wendelin's running for congress in this district and he and i um you know are 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 ready to work together um to make sure that the federal and the state laws and regulations do not cause problems. There is a lack of what we call processing capacity. I have met with um, farmers at uh, farmers markets in the Eastern Panhandle, and um, we have a lack of processing capacity. People are uh, buying cheap apple juice at the grocery store, but it does not contain West Virginia apples. And I reached out to a California company and said, hey, do you want to lighten your carbon footprint and not ship these beautiful little jars all the way from California? Um, We've got lots of apples here. And the representative from the company in Watsonville, California, said, no, no, we're just going to continue to truck from the Pacific Northwest states all that apple juice in tanker trucks, fill it here, and continue to flood our market. And that is why um, we have to focus our education efforts, our efforts to clear away regulations in such a way as we give our farmers a fair playing field. They do not have that yet. And uh, as I was speaking with uh, folks in Braxton County, a gentleman got up and said, you know, we could grow more food and be self-sustaining. And that is absolutely where we need to to be. And I know that if we give the people the the right uh, governing force, that we will be able to do what we need to do. Um, the other side's candidate, uh, for example, for governor, has said that he is opposed to the legalization of recreational adult use marijuana, for example, or excuse well, me, cannabis. So Deborah, these are all was issues about that milk, need to though. be ap- attended to simultaneously. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move into closing statements now, and you will go first, Deborah, with the closing statement. Um, I'm happy to go second. <laughs> whatever, um, whatever is, 
workable? No, you, we, it's in verse order of how we started. I think Kent had sure. the first opening statement, so you'll go first on the closing sure. statement. Well, um, again, there have been a lot of issues uh, bandied about, and unfortunately with the response um, uh, technique, um, I have um, not been able to really fully explain absolutely every policy, regulatory, um, uh, law, uh, change that I would like to see make. Now, we know that, that governing is hard, that governing is difficult. But if you have the right team, and I feel that I'm part of the right team, with Steve Williams at the top of the state ticket, with Teresa Torreseva, who has worked to uh, fix a situation in Wetzel County most recently that a lot of people are very happy about, with Marianne Claytor, who is an actual trained auditor, that is part of the team that I am part of, along with Steve Wendelin, Glenn Elliott, going to Congress, Senate, and uh, to the House of Representatives, I feel that this is a team that I can work with. Folks, we, we can grow West Virginia's future, but we've got to have a team that can work together, and I feel that with the team that I'm part of, that we can indeed bring back some of our processing capacity that has been lost, that we can see more folks being able to access the wonderful products all over the state, from maple syrup in Randolph County to McDowell County's uh, wonderful greens, uh, turnip greens, et cetera. We have an ability here to grow a lot more food, to grow a lot more fiber, and so I urge uh, voters to please consider uh, taking a look at all of us on the ticket. Thank you again, and I'm Deborah Stiles, and I'm running for Commissioner of Agriculture. Thank you, Deborah. Commissioner Leonhardt. Yes, uh, thank you all again very much. I'm Kent Leonhardt, once again, the Republican candidate for Commissioner of Agriculture, and I've been your Commissioner of Agriculture for almost eight years now. Uh, during that time, we've seen a tremendous growth in agriculture, and we've led the state through now a second crisis during those eight years. Uh, I'm a retired lieutenant colonel from the United States Marine Corps. I led men and women in peace and war for almost 21 years. My wife of 40 years and I started our farm that was abandoned in 1957, purchased in 1982 when I retired from the Marines in 96. We restored that 205 acre, original acres and added additional acreage to now we own 380 acres and at the height of our farming before I got into politics we had five additional leases at the same time. I never had a regulatory burden stop me from growing agriculture and I can tell you right now the regulatory burden has is a is quite a bit reduced since I've been Commissioner of Agriculture. I've testified before Congress on chronic wasting disease for the sportsmen out there to get the studies on chronic wasting disease consolidated throughout the country so we use your federal tax dollars wisely in attacking those things. My peers have elected me to be the uh, president of the Southern Association of State Departments of Agriculture. We hosted all those commissioners here in West Virginia in 2022. Uh, I'm currently the Vice President of the Southern U.S. Trade Association, and that is for agricultural trade overseas. We are setting West Virginia up to be able to send agricultural products outside the state and around the world. That is why I agreed to take on that position. Very honored to be elected by my peers to do so. Uh, agriculture is growing in West Virginia, and I want to make one comment. Uh, my opponent talked about navigators. We have four planning coordinators already on the ground that are connecting farmers to markets. I would love to have a few more, but funding is a little bit tight right now on that in that realm, but we expect to have a few more. So that's how we're growing it. We're doing some of the same things she's brought up, but we're already doing it. So and I'd like to give my opponent a West Virginia grown catalog because she talked about that yes, being I already have these I've been going all over the state enjoying those wonderful products thank you uh, and I'll take another well, one and share you're, it <laughs> you're, you're quite welcome to have that the uh, West Virginia grown program was dormant when I took office and we uh, revitalized it put a new logo on it and that product that's the product so anyway thank you all very much for having this forum we appreciate you both attending thank you so much and best of luck to you both in the upcoming election thank you we return in three minutes. If you or someone you know suffers from the disease of addiction, health